give a shout out to Eric up here for leading us in worship. I absolutely am loving uh, the singing. I love hearing you sing, and I'm grateful that he's here. Hey, I know it is uh, summertime, or I should say summer time. I know it's uh, the summer, but I want to ask you a question about school just for a quick second, okay? I want you to raise your hand if you have ever bombed, and I mean absolutely, completely bombed a test. Raise your hand. Hi, I'm proud. Yes. Keep your hand raised. Raise your hand if you've ever taken a test and you got a complete zero on it. No points, no credit whatsoever, a zero. Anybody? All right, all right. I see you out there. Uh, I once failed a very important test in my life. I was in the ninth grade, and it was November the 4th, which is my birthday. And in the ninth grade, I was turning 15 years old, and I was so excited. You know, you guys kind of wait these days uh, to get your learner's permit. It's kind of different. When I was in, in your age, we did not wait. We got it the day, like the second, you know, to the day to the second. You would go get your, learn we didn't call it a learner's permit. We called it a learner's license. You'd go get your learner's license, and uh, there was no driver's ed class in school, they just gave you a book, right? And they're like, here, read this book, and then you go take your learner's test. But you know what? When I was turning 15 in ninth grade, I was pretty sure I was super smart. I, I was good at taking tests, and I had been riding in a car for 15 full years. What could they possibly ask me on a learner's test that I didn't already know? Now, my dad, he told me probably a million and a half times to read the book. But did I read the book? No. My friends told me they didn't read the book. Uh, but it was a Thursday. I remember the day of the week. It's painful. It was a Thursday. I checked out of school, 10 a.m., and I told all my friends, I'm going to take the test. When I get back, I'll show you my learner's license. Oh, I was so excited. But I started taking the test. And I was answering questions that I did not know the answers for. It turns out you really do uh, need to read the book. Now, you're allowed to miss five questions and pass. But I missed one, two, three, four, five, six. I missed six, okay? There was this lady who's a police officer. She has a gun. <laughs> And she's grading my test, and she says, I'm sorry, you missed six. And I said, uh, I think you miscounted. Because <laughs> I, I don't fail tests. That, that's absurd. You know, I need, I need a recount. <laughs> Man, was I cocky. And she, she said, look here. <laughs> One, two, three, four, five, six. So I walked out of the place. Uh, my mom said, how would it go? I just shook my head. Uh, it was a quiet ride back to school that day. I walked into class. My friend said, let's see it. Where's your learner's license? And I said, uh, let's not interrupt class right now. Uh, you know, I'll show it to you later. And they're like, who cares about class? Show it to me now. So like the whole class is, is, is into it. And I'm like, hey, I will show you my learner's license at a date in the future, you know, a later time. And they, they just asked the question, what happened? Did you, fa did you fail the test? You big moron, did you fail the learner's test? And it was one of those moments where I, I wanted to disappear. I wanted to be invisible. I was so ashamed of myself if I had only read the book. Uh, I don't know if you've ever had an experience like that. Uh, there was another time I was about seven years old, and I had a dollar, and I went to the dollar store, and I, I don't even remember what I was buying, but this is what I do remember. I do remember that I did not know about tax. So I walk up with my dollar. I've been waiting in line. There's a line of people behind me, and the cashier says, it'll be a dollar and seven cents. I'm short. All I got is a dollar. 
Have you had a moment like that where you just didn't, you, you came up short? You just didn't have enough? I, I didn't have enough money with me. Or maybe you've had a moment where you couldn't get the lock off the door and there's 300 people watching you. Yeah. Right? That, that is not fun. Not fun. Okay? Now listen. Uh, in, in 2001, um, there's, there's a guy named Heath Ledger. I have a picture of Heath Ledger. Do you know who Heath Ledger is? He's almost as good looking as me. Right? Almost as good. I'm just kidding. Okay, that's Heath Ledger. And he, uh, um, he tra you know his story. He tragically died, I think, in 2009. It's, it's been a while. In 2001, he was in a movie called A Knight's Tale. Uh, has anybody seen that? This movie, <laughs> uh, this movie is a little bit older than some of you, okay? This movie is about 16 years old. But in A Knight's Tale, Heath Ledger plays the part of William. We have a picture of William. There's William right there sitting on his horse. Now, William, even though he doesn't look at there, William is a peasant. Okay, William is a peasant, and he is uneducated, and he has no money, uh, but he is pretending to be nobility in A Knight's Tale. The, the, mo the movie A Knight's Tale is inspired by Chaucer's Canterbury Tales. Uh, the story in the movie is not uh, from Chaucer's Canterbury Tales, but it's inspired by it. But William... He's trying to change his stars. He's trying to live a better life for himself than what he's been given, right? And so he's pretending to be a knight. He's fighting for glory and honor and for the hand of the woman he loves, who's Jocelyn. Now, there's a villain, and we have his picture too, uh, Count Adamar, right? And girls, you'll think he's dreamy as well. Uh, but Count Adamar is a real knight. He is nobility and he and William battle throughout this movie. The plot, their lives are, are intertwined, and Count Adamar also is vying for the hand of Jocelyn. Now, as they battle, almost every time, Count Adamar comes out on top, and he says a phrase to William to remind William of his low status, to remind William of all his failures, and this is what he says to him. He says, William, you have been weighed you have been measured and you have been found wanting. Now that, that's a phrase that actually is a, a biblical phrase. It comes from Daniel chapter 5. Uh, the writing of, on, on the wall, the hand appeared and wrote the king Belshazzar that you have been measured, you have been weighed, and you have been found wanting. And, and that's what Count Adamar continuously says to William through the movie. We have about a minute clip here that I want, you, I want to show you from the movie. Here, watch, watch this clip. strives to touch a star, oft stumbles at a simple straw. you this morning, have you had a moment in your life where you have been weighed, where you have been measured, and you realize that you have been found wanting? Have you, 
come upon that moment yet where you discovered, where you realized the horrible truth that you are a failure. I felt like that. I felt like that. And so has Peter. The same Peter who walked on water, the same Peter who caught all those fish with Jesus, the same Peter who we quote when we say the great confession, Peter the rock, he is so strong, but he certainly knows what it's like to fail. He knows what it's like to be weighed and measured and come short, to be found wanting. Now, the irony of Peter's failure is that it, you know, his most famous failure comes right after he's bragging and arguing that he's the greatest follower of Jesus ever, that he's the greatest apostle. And the story happens in Luke chapter 22, and it's time for the Passover. And Jesus sends Peter, Peter's the leader, right? Hey, Peter, I need you to go do something for me. That makes you feel real good, doesn't he? He sends Peter and John, Jesus sends Peter and John to make preparations for what's going to be the Last Supper. And when the time comes, Jesus and his apostles are reclined around the table. And Jesus is explaining, he's telling the apostles that he is about to suffer on the cross. Jesus takes the wine and he offers it to them. He says, this is the new covenant of my blood. Jesus takes the bread and breaks it and gives thanks. And then something really interesting happens in, in verse 21. If you have your Bibles, look at Luke chapter 22. We're going to turn to verse 21, and it's going to be on the screen here as well. And uh, this, this is Jesus talking, and he says, But the hand of him who is going to betray me is with mine on the table. The Son of Man will go as it has been decreed, but woe to the man who betrays him. They began to question among themselves which of them it might be who would do this. Also a dispute arose among them as to which of them was considered to be the greatest. Now isn't that odd? Jesus is revealing to the disciples that he's about to be betrayed and he's about to be murdered. And all that Peter and his friends want to do is argue about which of them is the greatest. <laughs> it doesn't make any sense. So imagine it this way. Okay, let's move our minds from the table and from the Last Supper. Let's move it to an athletic locker room. Okay, and imagine a soccer team getting ready for the biggest game of their lives, and the coach is preparing the team. The soccer coach is in the middle of this team, circled up, passionately preparing them for the game. And he's telling them, this is the match of your life. It's the World Cup at stake, and you're going to face your greatest opponent ever. And the coach needs his team to be totally focused on the task at hand. The coach outlines to his team the strategy that they must follow if they're going to have a chance to win. The coach has warned his team that the opponents are really, really, really good. And our opponents, they will take advantage of any weakness you show. But the minute that the coach stops talking to his team, the team starts to squabble about which one of them is really the best soccer player. And they boast about how many goals they've scored and uh, you know, they argue about who did the best in which game. The team quarrels about whether they should be playing that position or not. And they bicker about who's going to get to hold the trophy in the photographs after the game. And, you know, it would be hard to imagine a team less ready for a big game than that. And that's exactly what's happening around the table in the upper room at the Last Supper. Jesus is telling the twelve about the suffering that's about to come. And Peter looks around and says, I do believe that I'm the greatest one of us. I'm the greatest. And when they're arguing about this, it's clear they're not, they're not even listening to Jesus. And Jesus, frustrated, I'm sure, he, he tells them, he says, look, the greatest among us are those who serve. And by the way, Peter, it ain't you. Peter, you're not the greatest. J Jesus tells Peter in verses 31 and 32 something kind of weird. He says that Satan has asked to sift him as wheat, to take Peter and sift him as wheat. 
And Jesus says, he would have been able to, except that I prayed for you, Peter. Essentially, Jesus says, Peter, you're claiming to be great, but, but buddy, you're weak. And if it weren't for me, you would not have even lasted this long. <laughs> and Peter, God love him. He disagrees with Jesus. Like a cocky 15-year-old asking a police officer to regrade his learner's test. How stupid. And Peter says, Jesus, I'm ready. I'm ready to go with you to prison. I'm ready to die with you. And Jesus, with, <laughs> with compassion in his voice, he says, Peter, you're not ready to die for me. Before the rooster crows today, you will have denied even knowing me, not just once, not just twice, but three times. And sure enough, it isn't long before Jesus is arrested. <laughs> and when the soldiers arrive, man, big bad Peter, he pulls out his sword. <laughs> He's trying to back up his words. And we talked about it. He slices off an ear. And Jesus says, hey, no more of this fighting business. And this is amazing. Jesus touches the man's ear, and the man is healed. And then let's look at verse 54. Luke 22 uh, verse 54 it says then seizing him this is Jesus that they're seizing it says they led him away and took him into the house of the high priest Peter followed at a distance everybody say followed everybody say at a distance everybody say followed at a distance now, I want to geek out here for a second uh, about the words that Luke is using, these Greek words. Uh, the word that Luke uses for followed, like in our mind, it's like we see the soldiers taking Jesus and Luke is like uh, covertly, inconspicuously, like following the path, like following the leader, that type of game. And, and that's true. He is physically following Jesus, but that's not the word that Luke uses here. Luke uses the word that means He's following Jesus as a disciple. But Luke has added this phrase, at a distance, to it. And what Luke is saying is that Peter is still committed to Jesus. He's, he's committed to Jesus, but at a distance. Peter's following Jesus, but from over here now. From afar. From far away. I don't know about you, but that, that concept seems familiar to me. Following Jesus, but over here. You see, Peter used to be really close, but now he is still committed, but not quite. He's following from far away. And I think a lot of us here, I think a lot of us uh, are the same as Peter. When Jesus is around, when we're, when we're with the church, when we're at camp, we sing and we shout, and we will follow Jesus at all costs, and we'll do crazy things for him, even draw our swords to fight. But then outside this church environment, we seem to blend in pretty well, not wanting anyone to identify us as having been with Jesus. We follow Jesus, but it's from a distance. We act one way in his presence, and then we play it cool the rest of the time. And in our, our story, Peter's trying to play it cool, but people keep noticing him. They keep remembering him. They keep recognizing him. A, a girl says, hey, aren't, aren't, you, uh, aren't you the one that was with Jesus? Woman, I, I don't know him. I don't know him. And the man says, hey, uh, you're one of them, right? No way, man. It's not me. I don't know that guy. And the third time, hey, certainly, certainly, hey, you have the accent. I hear your voice, the accent from Galilee. Surely you're with Jesus. And in that Galilean fisherman sailor accent with some colorful language, he says, dude, I don't know what you're talking about. It's not me. And, it, and it's in that moment that the rooster crows. 
As Peter is saying those words, the rooster crows, and Luke tells us that the eyes of Jesus turn to Peter and their eyes meet. And the eyes of Jesus that are full of sorrow and the eyes of Jesus that are full of compassion, the eyes of the Savior lock with the eyes of shame, the eyes of Simon, the eyes of Simon Peter. Just hour, er, hours earlier, Peter says, I'm ready to die with you. And now he has denied even knowing him. And Peter realizes he has failed. Peter's struggling to make sense of it all, and all he can do is run. He runs outside, and he falls to his knees, and he weeps. Because Peter's been weighed. Peter has been measured. And he has been found wanting. Can you... Can you identify with Peter? Can you relate? Uh, have you noticed inconsistencies in, in your own life? Uh, and I don't mean like little things. I mean like big things. You know, ha have you felt so close to God, but then you, you live in this totally different life that you think nobody else sees? Have you been following Jesus from that far away place? You see, I know Peter's story well. I know his story because it's my story too. A story of hypocrisy. A story of inconsistent behavior. A story of failure. And I have a hunch that this might just be your story too. If you're like me at all, if you're like me even just a little bit, you don't like to acknowledge where you fall short. You don't like to talk about it. But here's the deal. If you want to grow in a relationship with Jesus, you have to face your failures head on. And just like for Peter, it's a dark night for your soul to journey through. But if you want to claim Jesus as your Savior, you have to admit that there is something you need to be saved from. If you want him to be your Savior, you have to say what it is that you need saving from. Peter came face to face with failure. And he began to deal with it. And those of us who are here, we have to admit our failures and we must wrestle with how we're going to deal with it. Now, there's a song um, that's about six or seven years old that I'm reminded of. Uh, it's a song by an artist whose name is Pink. Uh, the radio name of the song is, is Perfect. And I don't want to use the actual name of the song because the actual name has the F word in it. And that title makes me feel uh, uncomfortable. The lyrics of the song make me feel uncomfortable. And uh, the music video for the song it, it is terribly awful and terribly uncomfortable. In the music video... Uh, we meet the main character of the song just after she's committed a sexual mistake, a failure in purity. And then we see flashbacks of her life. We see scenes in her life uh, where she struggles with self-esteem, where she dishonors her, her mom and her dad, where she continues to lose the self-comparison game over and over and over again. And, and this girl in the music video, she eventually climbs into a bathtub and uses a razor blade to, to cut herself. Now, in this song and in this video, the artist Pink has painted a picture of failure. She's painted a picture of despair, and I believe that picture to unfortunately be painfully accurate for so many people in the world we live. And I believe it to be terribly accurate for so many people in this room, and that's why it's so uncomfortable for me to watch because my heart, my heart breaks for those of you in that place. And you know, with all that's wrong with that music video, there's something in there that's true. There's something in that song that's true. And, and this is what the words of the chorus say. It says, pretty, pretty please, don't you ever, ever feel less 
than perfect. Pretty, pretty please, if you ever, ever feel like you're nothing, then you're perfect. To me, the writer of the song seems to think that admitting your failures and acknowledging your imperfection is, in fact, the path to perfection. How could that be true? It, it seems like a paradox. It goes against what's natural. How can what's wrong with us, how can admitting our failures be what leads to something good? Now, John Mark Romans, he's a pastor at our church. He recommended this book to me, uh, and it's called Falling Upward. And you can already see the paradox in the title. How do you fall upward? But the author of this book, Falling Upward, says that you grow spiritually much more by doing it wrong than by doing it right. Let me read you a quote from this book. It says this, If there is such a thing as human perfection, it seems to emerge precisely from how we handle the imperfection that is everywhere, especially our own. What a clever place for God to hide holiness so that only the humble and earnest will find it. Uh, today, I want you to acknowledge your failures. I want you to talk about your imperfection, and I want you to call your failures by name. Because I know a name more powerful than your failures. And it's the name of Jesus. Because here's the deal. When I've reached points in my life where I was desperate, where I was drowning in failure, I always expect Jesus to reject me. Isn't he going to be ashamed of me? But let me tell you, instead of rejection, instead of casting me out, Jesus says, finally, finally you, you've come. And like a dad who has lost his son, he runs to me. And he wraps his arms around me. And he welcomes me home. You know, we've been singing songs about the fierce love that Jesus has and how powerful it is. We've been singing that when Jesus is the cornerstone, that the weak are made strong. And students, I just want to tell you, when you're weak, run to Jesus. Run to him. Peter denied Jesus three times. And Peter had to learn how to deal with that. And you have to deal with your failures too. And students, the answer is not cutting yourself. Please hear that in a, in a voice of love. It's not cutting yourself. The answer is not to drown yourself in alcohol. The answer is not having sex. The answer is not drugs. It's not painkillers. The answer is Jesus. When you are weighed, when you are measured, and when you are found wanting, that's just the place where Jesus is. And that's just the place that Jesus wants you to be. If I can encourage you today, it would be this. Please trust Jesus. Trust him. Will you be so bold as to call out your failures in your life? Hey, if you need to weep, like Peter wept, we're here, and we'll get on our knees, and we will weep with you. If you are willing to talk about your failures, then we would love to wrap an arm around you and listen. Please, please don't hold it in. Please do not pretend to be perfect. Let the amazing grace of our Savior Jesus wash over you and let it bring a peace. Let it bring hope. Let it bring love and joy to your heart. Will you pray with me? God, uh, so many times 